Okay, count down from five silently and start. Welcome everyone back to the lecture series, Algorithmic Sustainable Design. Today we have the ninth in the series. And uh, I will try to cover the following topics today. Symmetry production, symmetry breaking, classical moldings, elementary particle symmetries, and binding energy. <clears throat> and hopefully again, if I'm successful, these will make sense as a whole in today's lecture. Let me begin with symmetry production. Uh, human beings throughout history have produced multiple symmetries in artifacts, buildings, and cities. And if we look at the cultural record of humankind, it demonstrates we have an essential need for symmetry in our environment. Otherwise, why produce so, so many symmetries in uh, our, uh, in our um, artifacts and in our buildings and in our cities? And uh, please um, note that here I'm going to refer to complex symmetries. I'll never refer to just a simplistic overall symmetry, which is what most architects think of when they hear the word symmetry. Well, let me argue from a physiological basis why we need all these symmetries. Random information is too much for the human cognitive system to handle, and there's a very good reason for that, uh, known to all computer scientists who deal with uh, image compression. In a random design, you cannot compress the image because every single point has to be coded for a representation. That means that you have to denote information to every single point in the, uh, in the space of, um, of the image, your information input. That is a huge amount of memory. What happens when you have symmetries is that they significantly reduce the amount of information that needs to be processed. Each symmetry cuts down the amount of information. Now, our neural system evolved to interpret our environment. That's the only reason we are here, because we, we evolved in order to be able to negotiate our environment and uh, to recognize uh, structure in the environment. Uh, random information overwhelms our cognition, and where, uh, when our cognition is overwhelmed, we are programmed to feel alarm, which is natural. That's how we survive. When we cannot interpret our environment to make sure it is safe, then we trigger alarm inside. The adrenaline, uh, the adrenaline rises. We uh, set up the fight or flight syndrome that has saved us from extinction. Uh, the same occurs, uh, surprisingly, for visually empty environments because they are unnatural. Uh, our cognitive system did not evolve in visually empty, and I mean architecturally minimalist environments. Hence, they are also physiologically threatening. And um, There's a very nice uh, relationship that Stephen Wolfram, whom we have mentioned occasionally in this course, uh, has drawn a, a similarity between random environments and empty environments, because mathematically, uh, Wolfram has established the transition from a random visual environment to an empty visual environment. He, and he sets it up as follows, and, and please uh, go to his book, uh, in order to, to see his argument, which, which is rather seductive. Uh, he doesn't devote much time to it. But he says uh, that he has found in his uh, experiments that uh, randomness becomes um, uh, emptiness on the smaller scale, or conversely, that uh, emptiness is really randomness on a very, very small scale. And only um, uh, we tend to think of these as opposite, randomness versus emptiness, but uh, they meet in, in this uh, a very interesting manner. So let's leave randomness because we want symmetry. We want the opposite of randomness. Uh, translational symmetries uh, represent a shift along one direction, one axis. A reflectional symmetry uh, is something that is reflected about an axis, a mirror symmetry. And the rotational symmetry rotates about a point, the center. Of, of rotation, and I will mention uh, also a combination of uh, translation with reflection, which are glide reflections, are well known in the anthropological community. Here is translational symmetry. We have a, a unit that we shift 
in the horizontal direction, um, make many copies of it, and uh, the, the uh, resulting diagram shows translational symmetry. The uh, line of the symmetry uh, defines a symmetry axis. Translational symmetry is obtained by the repetition of non-trivial units. Alternation defines the repeating unit better by using contrast than simply empty repetition. This is, this is important. Uh, while we can uh, mathematically define a, a repetition along a symmetry axis, uh, the, the uh, repetition becomes more obvious, hence more intense and well-defined if we have uh, some uh, contrast. And this leads us to one of the properties uh, observed by Christopher Alexander. In lecture six, one of the properties was alternating repetition. So this is how it ties in to uh, lecture six. Here is reflectional symmetry, mirror reflection about an axis. And here we see the axis in the middle, the vertical axis in the middle. Uh, I show this, this uh, very simple diagram uh, because I'm going to talk about uh, axes that are not explicit a little later. But let me now look at all possible reflectional symmetries that we can use in, uh, in building and, and in urbanism. The axis for reflectional symmetry is fine in any direction as long as it's on the floor, as long as it's in the uh, x and y um, dimensions. There is no preference for an axis on the surface of the earth, uh, except if you're building, uh, if you're ancient people building a temple, then you want the axis to align with, uh, say, uh, the, uh, the summer solstice or, or uh, or a certain uh, religious orientation, but that's, uh, that is a choice, a cultural choice. However, a vertical axis is not a cultural choice. It's a, it's, we don't have a choice at all because the vertical axis is essential for our physiological feeling of stability. Therefore, mirror symmetry must define a vertical axis. I mean, true vertical. Otherwise, the design of structure feels unbalanced. And this, this of course, has, uh, has immediate and tremendous consequences for architecture, especially contemporary architecture. Uh, many times, uh, reflectional symmetry does not show its axis. The axis is not explicit, it is implicit. But still, the human brain immediately does the computations in a fraction of a second and, uh, and defines that axis implicitly. So we, we register the axis and then we, uh, we adjust that axis and compare it to the true vertical, and if it's not true vertical, then it causes anxiety because we feel alarm at a form that does not have a, a true vertical axis. So um, reflectional symmetries that have either an explicit or implicit diagonal axis give rise to anxiety in humans, whereas um, a horizontal axis is fine, and, and horizontal uh, in two dimensions, it can be in any of the, of the horizontal dimensions. Uh, and we have a, a positive feeling for symmetry because uh, a symmetry, um, going back to the beginning of, of, uh, of the lecture, symmetry reduces the information overload, so we get a positive reaction. Now, the reason for what I just said is that the human sensory system evolved with gravity and evolved to orient us to gravity. Uh, and here is not just the eye. Uh, what I'm talking about also includes the ears and the balance mechanism that is, uh, that is in the inner ear. All that uh, is, is, is a very finely tuned to uh, attach us to the gravitational axis, which is therefore built into our, into our physiology. Um, this is nothing aesthetic about this. Uh, so we, re we react with alarm or nausea to non-vertical axes, whether they be implicit or explicit. And this reaction cannot be learned or changed. You can go to, um, to an architecture class and I can tell you that a diagonal building is, is very beautiful and you can even uh, learn to say that it is very beautiful, but you go in it and you will feel nausea. Uh, on the left, uh, I know James is a nice guy, so he pulled the stunt and he became famous, good for him, and, uh, and uh, that's the way the architecture world works. Uh, however, uh, the building on the right, say an old traditional a uh, farmhouse on church has an implicit vertical axis defined by its reflectional symmetry and it makes us feel uh, comfortable, 
a positive sense of well-being, and uh, we tend to prefer such buildings because they, they uh, add positively to our physiological state, whereas um, uh, buildings on the left uh, give us a thrill uh, because they make us feel uh, anxious. Here is the rotational symmetry going around. This is a discrete rotational symmetry. We have a large number of examples of rotational symmetry in architecture and urbanism. For example, the stained glass windows in medieval cathedrals are rotationally symmetric. The open ground plans of uh, religious buildings and circular plazas, open plazas, or uh, indoor spaces, some circular uh, structures, many circular structures. Um, uh, however, circular structures are not, are not always well adapted to use. Uh, so um, the, the, the will, there's usually a, uh, an overlap and embedding between, between um, circular structures and more rectangular structures. Uh, let me go back to one of the previous lectures. I showed traditional villages in, in Africa, in sub-Saharan Africa, there is a circular, definite circular structure, and the embed embedding there, I showed this example of fractals. So we have small circles embedded into large circles. And uh, the whole village is, is a beautiful example of a fractal. Uh, uh, in the West, we most often find circular symmetry uh, in, in urbanism in large buildings uh, where uh, um, circles are embedded in, in, in more uh, rectangular structures or vice versa, uh, rectangular structures are, are embedded in circular structures. Anyway, the, there's an infinite... Um, number of rich possibilities that we use, and if you look around, you will see most of these. Uh, let me talk about uh, the, the simplest combination of, uh, of two of the three basic symmetries, which are known as glide reflections. You combine a translation, you move something over, and then you flip it down, you reflect it down. So you have a, a, a combination of, um, of translation and reflection, and that gives you what's called glide reflections. Uh, these are known uh, in the artistic uh, community, not in the contemporary artistic community, which doesn't uh, care about their symmetry, but in the anthropological community, since uh, these are found in the artifacts of, of uh, humankind over uh, millennia and all over the world. So the glide reflections combine translations with reflections into new symmetry. And um, this is, uh, as I said, the simplest such combination. Well, mathematically, there are a total of 14 ways we can combine the three fundamental symmetries, not trivially. The three fundamental symmetries being translation, reflection, and rotation. So uh, glide reflections is the first combination, and there exist 13 more. Uh, these 17 uh, combinations of, of, of uh, symmetries are called the 17 plane symmetry groups. Uh, why are they called the plane symmetry groups? Uh, the reason is that we can use these combinations to, to tile a plane. We can create tiling patterns. And if we, if we make a classification of the, all the possible tiling patterns, we get uh, 17 of these that are mathematically distinct. And these are also known in mathematics as the wallpaper group, because since um, we here in the West are not very uh, used to uh, tiling patterns, or rather we have a tradition of wallpaper, so we call these the wallpaper groups. Uh, I could give a whole lecture on, on the 17 plain symmetries, but this is not the lecture. Uh, I'm not interested in decoration, I'm interested here in the fundamentals of architecture. So it is incredible that this mathematical result, which is a classification of 17 plain symmetries, was carried out by human beings before, before the mathematics was uh, developed. Uh, Islamic art discovered most, if not all, of the 17 plane symmetries, at least 15 of the plane symmetries, uh, before the 16th century, uh, and applied them to tiling patterns. And that was before we, we had the mathematical classification. And uh, m most of these symmetries are found in all human art and artifacts going back to, to thousands of years. So this is a great achievement of the human brain. Uh, 
but these were erased by 20th century minimalism. Here is a statement by Le Corbusier. Decoration is of a sensorial and elementary order as is color and is suited to simple races, peasants and savages. The peasant loves ornament and decorates his wall. This is a statement from his book, which is used as a textbook in the majority of architecture schools today all over the world. Now, Le Corbusier was saying this as a condemnation. Who is he referring to as peasants and savages? The rest of the world? Uh, human beings that had developed um, ornamentation and color to give their life some meaning? How about religious architecture and all the ornamentation of religious architecture whether in Islamic art, uh, Buddhism, Christianity, Judaism. Was Le Corbusier referring to all of these religious traditions, all these architectural traditions? Well, I don't know. Le Corbusier died. But um, if he was referring to all of humankind in his condemnation, then I would like to include myself and my friends, Christopher Alexander and Leon Creer and many other friends, we love color, we love ornament, we love to decorate our walls. Therefore, according to Le Corbusier, we are savages and inferior human beings. The problem is that today, the institution of art and architecture uh, promotes a certain dominant design system and a dominant design ideology which erases multiple symmetries on all the smaller scale. And as it erases these symmetries on the smaller scales, it insists often on a simplistic overall symmetry on the larger scale. But such an overall symmetry is totally useless. It is a statement of, uh, of uh, the heroic modernist period, which insisted on, uh, on uh, a useless overall symmetry. What we need are the small symmetries. And I hope you're convinced of that statement by the end of, of this lecture. So our artifacts and building, the built environment of the 20th century are so much poorer and, and lifeless without the complex symmetries that we see in the millennia of human existence before the 20th century. And today, in the 21st century, when we're not getting any better because we're still fo following these outdated ideologies. Let me move now to the next topic in today's lecture, symmetry breaking. Symmetry breaking has to do with information compression. The human brain gains most sensory pleasure from designs that can be compressed, but not too easily. It does require um, some information because we have evolved in natural environments which have a, a pretty high degree of information. The representation code should be neither too long in a random design nor too short. Uh, what do I mean by that? Um, in, a, in a computer program, you represent something, and you code it by, say, one unit. You, uh, give, you give a description of the single unit, and then you can just add, here is the unit, here's the description, and then one more command, repeat this indefinitely and that's an identical repeated unit. <clears throat> but that's really very little information. Uh, the human mind wants a little more than that. Here's an example, an empty repetition. Uh, very well, this, is, this has some symmetry, but, but the information is so little that it, it certainly does not give us any pleasure. Uh, it, does, uh, it tends, um, in fact, to give us uh, to give us the opposite, which is boredom, and it's certainly not enough information to keep us interested. So the human mind craves a little more information on which to work. If we, uh, we can take advantage of symmetry breaking in order to establish a larger scale. And what do I mean by that? You have repeating units, 
which would be perfectly symmetrical, but then you make each one slightly, slightly different. You change the units just enough so that they're no, no longer informationally collapsible into one identical unit. Informational collapse means that you take all the, all the units and they're equivalent to a single unit, therefore they collapse into one unit. So what we want is many copies of this unit and then you change this copy just so slightly in order to make them distinct. However, you don't want to ruin the overall symmetry. The overall symmetry is going to be translation or reflectional symmetry. And you don't want to ruin that by making them too different. So you want to just make them slightly different. Uh, I hope I'm getting this across. These are important concepts which are rarely discussed. So we want the perfect balance between uh, keeping the symmetry and losing the entire symmetry and, and going into randomness. The first step is, is the most trivial step, alternating repetition. Uh, harking back to lecture six, we have made some changes here so now that the unit that repeats is no longer a single square, but it is a two, uh, the black and white square together, that repeats. And it's, it's slightly more interesting than uh, just the, um, the previous, this one, which is uh, totally boring. So we're, we're in a, now in a position to discuss informational richness. Monotonous repetition is unsatisfying precisely because it is compressible. And the mind craves richer information because of the way the mind is structured, the way the mind has evolved. Symmetry breaking does provide variety by carefully introducing randomness on particular scales. And I'm going to take some time now to discuss how uh, randomness is introduced uh, on particular scale in order to, to give richer information to the mind. Here is an example of symmetry breaking. I have the identical unit repeated showing translational symmetry, but then I have gone in and I have made changes to each unit. So a quick look at this tells me I have perfect uh, translational symmetry, but closer examination shows that I don't because each unit is different. So here is an example of symmetry breaking, and now I can um, summarize what we mean by this. Symmetry breaking breaks symmetry just a little bit in the way I have shown. And I claim that this is a, an extremely important uh, tool in design, uh, not only in, uh, in ornamentation, but in the design of buildings all the way up to the scale of cities. Let's look carefully at traditional artifacts, which are highly repetitive with uh, symmetric designs. When we look carefully, we see that the repetition is most often not simple. The repeating units always have subtle changes on a certain scale. So this proves my point that symmetry and symmetry breaking are found coexisting on distinct scales. These are two mechanisms that act hand in hand, symmetry and symmetry breaking. <clears throat> if we want to, we can use the word roughness to describe symmetry breaking. Since the symmetries found in both nature and human artifacts are only approximate, uh, we, can, we can describe this as a rough symmetry. Uh, however, there are problems with, uh, with both words. Roughness uh, usually implies something negative, whereas here I want to imply something positive. I want to, to say that roughness in symmetry is a much more sophisticated mathematical notion than just strict regularity, because strict regularity gives us informational collapse, which is a, a, a bad mathematical property. But I wanted to introduce the word roughness so that we, we, uh, we uh, link back to lecture six with one of the uh, properties noticed by Christopher Alexander, which is roughness. And here, making the link between the roughness property and um, uh, symmetry breaking. So here is an example of alternating repetition with uh, symmetry breaking. We have something that is obviously, uh, that obviously has translational symmetry in the horizontal direction. When we look closely, we see that all these are actually different, but they're similar enough that our mind perceives this as a symmetry on this scale, and there are internal symmetries on smaller scales, but we have a very uh, a simple um, combination of symmetry with symmetry breaking. So this little diagram, I hope, 
illustrates what I'm talking about. And uh, going back to my, to my previous statement, go to the ethnographic museums or, or look on the World Wide Web to see cultural artifacts, and you will find this extreme sophistication of combination of symmetry and symmetry breaking. If you look at the caption of the ethnographic books, sometimes you will see the, the influence of, uh, of 20th century design with a caption like, uh, these people did not have the technology to make uh, the symmetry perfect. Well, <laughs> that's totally wrong. It's a total misunderstanding. These people, going back to prehistoric times, could make perfect symmetry if they wanted to, but perfect symmetry leads to informational collapse, so they didn't. And many of our ethnographer, ethnographers today are influenced by this silly notion from the architecture um, world and, and miss the whole point of the symmetry breaking found in these artifacts. So symmetry breaking creates an irreducible hierarchy. Irreducible means it cannot be reduced to a single repeated uh, unit. It's the same uh, meaning as the um, as avoiding uh, informational collapse. And the larger scale in a scaling hierarchy is established or fixed when the smaller scale can no longer be collapsed into one unit. So symmetry breaking is essential to stabilize the hierarchy against collapse because symmetry breaking stabilizes the higher level, the higher unit on the larger scale. Otherwise, you just have a, a repetition of, of the small scale, and you have no real larger scale. Now, the market and connoisseurs value artisanal production of the same artifact because of the inevitable minor variations. For example, a wall of identical machine-made tiles is not as attractive as a wall made of imperfect hand-painted tiles. I discussed this with uh, some of my colleagues. Who, uh, who run architectural offices, and they go to the clients and they tell them, well, for this low price, we can put tiles on the wall. These are machine-made tiles. Or for a much, much larger price, we can uh, put hand-painted tiles. And you will see the difference. And the difference is positive, because the brain will perceive the effect of minor variations in the individual hand-painted tiles. When, when you go up, to the actual tile and you measure it, you see that the variation could be one millimeter. Yet you stand back from the wall made of, of 300 hand-painted tiles and you feel that this is alive. Why do you feel it is alive? Because of the symmetry breaking due to these minor variations. Now let's move to another topic, classical moldings. There is unexpected support from and for the classical form language. Moldings are presented as the atomic units of classical architecture. Well, I'm drawing now from the educational system of Donald Ratner, who's an architect in New York City and uh, teaches or, or used to teach with the Institute of Classical Architecture. And he has done a very nice presentation <coughs> of the combinatorics of moldings. Moldings are the smallest elements in the classical form language. And they're all symmetric. That's why I mentioned them in this talk. In fact, they play a central role in this talk. They have the combinatoric property because they're used to create large-scale units. There is no classical building without moldings. Where do we learn about moldings? Well, I am sorry. They're never taught in architecture schools. They have been banned from architecture schools. You can go to your uh, local lumber yard or hardware store and find commercially available moldings, because the whole world uses moldings, but yet they're never taught in architecture schools. Or you can uh, go to uh, the Institute of Classical Architecture and take a course with um, Donald Ratner, which I strongly recommend. Moldings add translational symmetry, like this one, perfectly symmetric, translationally symmetric, they express the gravitational force. Moldings express the effects of gravity by appropriate horizontal articulations. They mimic the effect of squeezing materials through weight. So they signify for us gravity. In that case, the moldings are not decorative. 
but they directly enhance human well-being because we need to feel assured about a building. And we feel assured about a building when gravity is expressed visually in terms of something like a molding. That's why moldings arose in, in the form languages that we use. This is the opposite aim from Le Corbusier's deliberate, deliberate anti-gravity typologies, whose aim was to cause anxiety by cutting the connection to the, to, uh, the gravitational force. Here is a very stylized molding for top to hold up uh, the ceiling, a molding for the middle. All of these express gravitational force in a stylized form, but it, it's enough to, to affect our psychology and our physiology, our sense of well-being. And a molding for the bottom. Now, I'm not proposing you use these moldings for your next project, but keep in mind what I said about the necessity to feel reassured about gravita the gravitational force uh, uh, in the tectonics of your building. Now, there are, there's an enormous variety of moldings, and uh, um, you have to take uh, um, a Donald Ratner's course to, to, to find out or uh, look at some of the old books, all of which are out of print, incidentally, on uh, how to, uh, to create and design moldings. So within the three categories of moldings for the top, middle, and the bottom, there are further internal variations. And classical architecture uses all of these to achieve solidity and balance. And uh, if you notice uh, that there is universal scaling through the moldings, because each molding has subdivisions obeying the universal scaling, which I spent two lectures discussing. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to give you a course in classical moldings. For that, you have to go elsewhere. And, and as I said earlier, already, it's extremely difficult to be taught classical moldings. But instead, I will now make a comparison with uh, the um, uh, 15 fundamental properties that were observed by Christopher Alexander and given uh, in lecture six of the series. When I go to Donald Ratner's notes, then I see words like alternation, contrast, scale, repetition, coordination, proportion, reduction, etc. But these are the words straight from the 15 fundamental properties. So what does that tell me? Well, Donald Ratner does not know Christopher Alexander's work on the fundamental properties. Donald Ratner is giving us a 2,000-year-old system of, of a construction which has evolved these properties independently. So the, um, the classical design vocabulary already contains the universality and adaptation and the theory of, of, of hierarchies that I've been uh, discussing in, in uh, the, the present series of lectures. The classical form language is one of the most successful ever discovered, and it has evolved its own version of mathematical coherence. So for a, for a language, a form language like the classical language that has been so useful and for so long, we should not be surprised that it looks so much like what I have been talking about. I have not been talking about the classical form language. I have been talking about general mathematical rules that all adaptive form languages need to obey in order to, uh, to uh, satisfy human biological needs. At the same time, the classical form language has been used for so many years all over the world. It has evolved this adaptation. If it did not have it already in classical Greece of the 5th century BC, it picked it up later during Rome, etc., as it evolved throughout the ages. So biologists know of the process of, of convergent evolution. Two things will uh, independently evolve the same useful characteristics. So the classical form language has evolved its own useful characteristics to what I'm discussing in more general terms. The, for, the classical form language is extremely adaptive, and um, it has adapted to local traditions. So let me um, look into, into uh, the historical record of form languages. Every place in the world on the earth has evolved this traditional form language, which is not classical. Classical form language evolved in Greece and Rome. However, the Greeks and the Romans went and took their form language all over Europe and all the way to India, uh, all over the, the Mediterranean, 
So during many centuries, the classical language was applied around the world. And the buildings adapted to include elements from the local form languages. This is a, a phenomenally rich source of form languages, yet they're dismissed as hybrid by modernists. And the word hybrid is used in the most pejorative sense, like racists use the word hybrid. They don't want to, to look at these buildings that are adapting the classical form language to local conditions. But throughout uh, history and, th and uh, through the 19th century when we had uh, European colonial powers, buildings have adapted to the local vernacular form languages. So we have extremely successful colonial buildings that are now totally ignored by the architectural historians, as if they don't exist. These are the buildings that extend the classical form language to, uh, to adapt to local conditions and have created a whole new um, uh, repertoire of different form languages. And when you go to a special place, And you ask them, what, is the, what are the most beloved buildings in this place? Suppose it was a formal colonial um, city in the world. Well, when they finally got rid of, of, the, uh, of the occupying power, there was a reaction against the uh, architecture introduced by the occupying power. And inevitably, if this, if this thing happened in the 20th century, uh, there was an introduction of uh, modernist architecture, which is uh, supposed to be um, uh, liberating uh, for uh, newly independent countries. But the, the newly independent countries uh, discovered, most of them, very quickly that the, the new uh, glass and uh, steel buildings were totally unsuited to the local climate, the culture, the, uh, the living conditions, uh, uh, in many cases, total fiascos. And they discovered that the old buildings, which were somehow a, an adaptation of the classical form language to the local form language survive and are beautiful. They work extremely well and they're loved by all the, uh, by all the people except the, uh, the faculty at the local architecture schools who, who still cling to the uh, modernist typologies. Uh, it did not help that uh, governments themselves adopted the modernist form language after after independence, for example, Pandit Nehru, who did many wonderful things for India's independence, then uh, brought Le Corbusier to, uh, to design Chandigarh, and uh, that set a very bad precedent for Indian architecture since. Now, to, to finish up with, with the classical moldings, they are an essential component of the form language, the classical form language. They help to establish the smaller scale by focusing on it directly. And according to our theory of design coherence, the smallest scale supports all the higher order forms. This is, a, this is a fundamental property in all systems. In system theory, the smallest scale has to support all the higher order forms. Let me take a new approach to design, not for you to, to apply, but for you to go through as an exercise. Let's take Donald Ratner at his word. Use moldings as atomic units of design. We'll design a project as an exercise by starting with the most appropriate moldings. And then we connect the moldings with plain surfaces, the wall, the ceiling, and the floor. This is a true bottom-up process of design. What do we learn from this? Well, I'm not going to go through it here, but this is what I expect we'll learn from it. We learn the duality between units and connections. So let me ask the following leading question. Which are the tectonic units and which are the connections? The theory of centers, which I covered in earlier lectures, tells us that there is no distinction. So we have a duality. Moldings connect planes and planes connect moldings. So there is a perfect duality between units and connections. Which are the units and which are the connections? This duality between units and their connecting glue has a precedent because the same phenomenon occurs in elementary particle physics, which I'm going to discuss next. These are the basic units of the physical universe, the, the, uh, the constituents of matter. Physics supports our theory of design by analogy, and I'm going to discuss that. Let me conclude by 
giving a final oral moldings. Since I have shown you the duality between moldings and walls, duality means that things are interlocked together, like the yin and yang. Do you think that moldings now can be dismissed as irrelevant, as mere uh, decoration? I have argued that moldings are just as important as the walls, because we can flip. We can start by designing with moldings and then connect the moldings with the walls, rather than putting up the walls and putting a molding to connect the different surfaces. So please think about this. I think that following this uh, derivation, somebody should think very, very carefully about pointing to a molding and saying this is totally irrelevant, and we can omit it. Now, I, it's my pleasure to take you on a little tour of elementary particle symmetries, which I used to work in when I was younger. The elementary particle interactions are symmetric under the group SU3, the special unitary group in three dimensions. And I'm not going to explain that here. Architects don't care about this. But this is analogous to rotational invariance in a space of internal dimensions. And in one of these lectures, I mentioned about the internal dimension and special symmetries in internal dimensions. But uh, the reason I'm going through this is because symmetry breaking occurs in elementary particle symmetries. And what happens here? Well, let's start with a degenerate nucleon without symmetry breaking. With perfect hypercharge symmetry, and you don't need to know what hypercharge is, there is only one nucleon. The nucleons are the elements that comprise the atomic nucleus. But that means that there are no atoms, for reasons I will explain later. So spontaneously broken hypercharged symmetry creates different particles. Instead of a single nucleon, we have several nucleons, and we have the baryons, the sigma particle, the lambda particle, and the xi particle, and each one has a different mass. And here's a different mass. So Breaking hypercharge symmetry creates mass differences, whereas if, if, there were no, if there were perfect hypercharge symmetry, we would have a single nucleon with mass about 1,000 MeV mega electron volts. Now, the, the, uh, uh, breaking the hypercharge symmetry gives us different masses for the different particles, namely the, the uh, N is the neutron, P is the proton, lambda particle, the sigma particle, and the Xi particle. So here's an explicit example of symmetry breaking occurring in the fundamental uh, units of the universe. If that's not enough, there is a further symmetry breaking, and that's an electromagnetic symmetry breaking. There's another axis to this. There is the isospin axis, and you don't need to know what isospin is, but there is a further breaking of the symmetry along the isospin axis, and that creates particles with different charge, so that our generic nucleon separates into the, into the neutron, which is neutral, and the proton, which is positively charged. The sigma separates into the sigma minus, sigma zero, sigma plus, where these are the charges, and the xi separates into xi minus and xi zero. And all these are very exotic sounding. And when we plot the, the, um, all the, the particles that we actually see in the laboratory, in the isospin uh, axis on the horizontal and in the um, hypercharge uh, axis on, on, the, on the vertical, we get this beautiful octet, which was responsible for several Nobel Prizes in physics uh, in the early 1960s. Uh, if you want beauty in nature, look no further. The, uh, the, uh, the baryon octet is one of the most beautiful uh, physical um, uh, structures. Now, Let's, uh, time to move back in, into architecture. What, what can we learn from this? We learn that the fundamental constituents of matter have a strong symmetry, which is the uh, SU3 symmetry, but it is only approximate because it is, sim it is broken. However, we also learn that the breaking of the symmetry is absolutely necessary to generate both mass and charge. Therefore, mass is responsible for matter. The whole universe is responsible I mean, the whole universe uh, results from the symmetry breaking. And the charge is responsible for the atoms. Without charge, we won't have an atom, because each atom consists of, of a bound state through electromagnetic coupling. And now let's, let's move quickly to analogies for, for design. Uh, 
in, in design and architecture and urbanism, strong but imperfect symmetries give rise to living structure. Observed symmetry breaking has a remarkable parallel in broken elementary particle symmetries. The local rotational symmetry on the small scales is imperfect on the large scale. This is the, the notion of symmetry breaking and the prevention of informational collapse. A diagram to show what I'm talking about in, in, uh, in architecture. A, well, I, sh I show here a broken large-scale translational symmetry containing perfect small-scale rotational symmetries. So looking at this very quickly, you say, aha, here's something that's translation translationally symmetric, but it is only uh, up to a point because uh, each one of these um, disks is separate, yet each disk is itself perfectly rotationally symmetric in itself. So uh, this single slide here demonstrates what I'm talking about. And before I go on, let me make a, a parenthetical remark. Had I given this lecture as the first lecture of this series, people would have raised some objections and would say, well, you're talking about elementary particles. What do these have to do with architecture? Architecture is in and of itself. Well, this is the ninth lecture in the series. I hope that during eight lectures I have been able to convince you that Architecture is an expression of natural forces, physical forces, the way matter is put together to create the universe. So we can no longer just uh, uh, um, think of architecture as totally separate from reality. I have argued using physical arguments, biological arguments, and I'm getting a more humanly adaptive architecture as a result of those arguments. So today, at this particular point in the lecture series, I hope that you will pay more, uh, you will give more value to an analogy that comes from, from some, something that's, that may, may seem irre irrelevant at first, but the more you think about it, I think the more you realize the, the, the importance of the analogy I'm drawing between symmetries in elementary particle physics and symmetries in architecture. So to wrap up the analogy with elementary particle physics, there are imperfect large-scale symmetries, but there are essential symmetries on the smaller scales. And these symmetries occur in internal dimensions. And that now raises other, more, more um, uh, global questions that I have addressed in, in, uh, in one of the earlier lectures. But what we need here in today's lecture is, is to realize that something fundamental is happening on the small scale not only in, in physics, but also in architecture and urbanism. And what is happening on a small scale? Well, that's, here's the last section of today's lecture, the binding energy. So going back into physics again, we have another lesson to learn. There's the well-known conversion relation between mass and energy. Oh, everyone knows what the conversion is between energy E and the mass M, E is equal to mc squared, where C is the speed of light, the famous formula derived by Albert Einstein. Many, not all of, maybe not all of you know what it means. It means that if you are able to convert energy into mass, you can take a lot of energy and make a little bit of mass, or take a little bit of mass and make a lot of energy. Uh, what I need to apply today is that you need energy to bind components of mass together into larger holes. So let me talk about, uh, at the same time, about the elementary constituents of matter and also architectural components. If you take constituents and put them next to each other, they will not bind together. You need extra binding energy. You need that connectivity. They will forever remain as separate units unless you bind them. But binding requires energy, it requires effort. So the binding energy is the glue of matter, is the glue that holds things together. And when you actually succeed in putting something together to make it coherent, then the mass of the whole will equal the mass of the constituents plus the binding energy, because you are actually putting in effort in order to bind them together. Now, Continue with physics, let me review for you 
certain of the very important constituents that, that bind together to form holes. Uh, and I will go, uh, uh, and I will list the examples in decreasing size. In the larger size that I want to talk about today, uh, atoms bind together to form molecules. And we see molecules rather than, than atoms because they're a stabler uh, form of matter. And it is molecules that crystallize together. And we see crystals, which contains an enormous amount of molecules. Going to the smaller scale now, it is the nuclei and the electrons that bind together to form atoms. The nuclei, from the process of symmetry breaking from, of SU3 that I, that I discussed uh, two minutes ago, the nuclei are positively charged thanks to symmetry breaking. And electrons, of course, are negatively charged, so the electrons uh, form shells around the nuclei, and that's why how, that's how we have atoms, and that's why we have a universe. Let's go inside the atom to the nucleus. The positively charged nucleus is formed of nucleons, the neutron and the protons. M many neutrons and protons bind together to form the atomic nucleus. And they also need binding energy to bind together. Otherwise, you just have loose uh, nucleons. You don't have a nucleus, which, which combines into a nice compact mass. And going down to the smaller scale that we know today, even the nucleons, the neutron and the proton, we believe to be made out of quarks. So quarks are the most fundamental particles we can conceive of, at least today. And the quarks bind together to form either a neutron or a proton or the other octet members that I showed you the pretty picture of, the, the lambda, the xi, and the sigma particles. And now let's, let's uh, go towards architecture by looking at the amount of binding energy. How much binding energy is required to bind masses together into a larger coherent whole? It's a very good question. Because I'm going to jump to the analogy of, of connections in, in architecture uh, that, are, uh, that are going to be the analogy of the binding energy. Well, in, in subatomic physics, the binding energy depends on the size of the whole. And this is a, a fascinating uh, discovery in, in uh, physics. As we go down in scale, the binding energy becomes as large as the mass itself. This is a crucial result. As we go down in scale, the binding energy becomes as large as the mass. Namely, you need more and more binding energy to bind things together if they are small. If things are large, you need less binding energy to bind them together we can already start to see the analogy with architecture. But before I jump into architecture, I will give you some figures from physics. We know the, the ratio of binding energy to the uh, size of a composite unit. For example, you take nuclei and electrons, you bind them together, you put in some binding energy, and you make an atom. How much binding energy is there compared to the, to the mass of the atom. Well, here it is, one-tenth of one percent, 0.001 percent binding energy takes to, uh, to uh, uh, bind nucle uh, the nucleus and the electrons together to make an atom. Fine, that's very small. Now, let's go to the smaller scale. To make a nucleus, how much binding energy do you need? Well, you need one percent binding energy. Of the, of the mass of the nucleus. You take the new, uh, neutrons and protons and stick them together with your glue in order to make a nucleus, and that glue is 1% of the total mass of the nucleus. And now let's go down to the smallest of the scales. You take some quarks, put them together to make a, a nucleon. Usually you have three quarks, you put them together to make a nucleon. How much binding energy do you need? Well, you need 100%. You need as much binding energy as the stuff you're putting together. 100% of, of the size of the mass of the nucleon comes from the binding energy. So what do we learn from this? We learn that binding energy becomes matter on the lowest scale. Binding energy actually becomes matter. And now we'll make a quick turn to architecture. What is the smallest scale in architecture? It is ornament until you go down to the physical scale, which is the texture uh, 
in the materials. But the smaller scale that we build is ornamental. If I take this analogy, then the binding energy becomes a design itself on the smaller scale. Therefore, I'm led to the conjecture that ornament becomes substance. How do we describe substance in architecture? Well, let's say it is a perceivable quality. Substance you feel. And it's analogous to the mass in physical matter. A positive substance in a building anchors the building in our cognition. And it makes it possible for us to connect to that structure. And therefore, it will be responsible for the success of the building with users. How is substance achieved? Well, that's the whole point of design. You combine different tectonic components into a whole, and then you have a building, and either the building is successful or not. But have we, in recent years, neglected the glue that becomes substance? In architecture and urbanism, the strongest binding energy acts on the smallest perceivable scale to humans. So now we're not... I have taken the analogy from subatomic physics, which is microscopic, and I'm applying it to our human range of scales, which are one millimeter to, to uh, two or three meters, uh, just for architecture and, and going uh, larger, becoming larger for urbanism. Tectonic components in a building are held together in our mind by connections, symmetries and symmetry breaking, which I have spent today discussing. But, also, we have found that at a smaller scale, the binding glue itself becomes a substance. Since binding on the smaller scale is essential for coherence and sense of substance in any building, and this is true for any shape or size, then we have to pay particular attention to the smaller scale. At the level of ornamentation, which is the smaller scale, the connections become the object itself. What is the object? The object is the building. So what, what, what am I saying now? Am I saying that, that the ornamentation becomes the building? Yes, because the building, according to all my lectures, the building is defined on many different scales, on a hierarchy of scales. And now I'm zeroing in on the smaller scales. The larger scales are all dependent upon the smaller scale. And what is the smaller scale? It is the ornamentation. So all the larger scales, namely the building itself, is dependent upon the ornamentation. What if there's no ornamentation? What if we have a modernist building? Well, here is a little deception that many architects have practiced. They have insisted on, on a high degree of precision on the smaller scale a precise alignment of straight edges. They have talked about uh, and spent a lot of money getting precise alignment to replace ornamentation. But I'm sorry, this generates no coupling or binding energy. This is totally wasted. It is an intellectual idea that does not lead to coherence. It does not lead to life in a building. Because if you have precise alignment of straight edges, like in a, in a modernist technological building or high-tech building, there are no small units. There is no coupling. There is no binding energy. And I'm trying to convince uh, you, my uh, audience, that binding energy is necessary in order to give architectural life. And if you don't have it, the form is dead. Now I'm going to argue from the other direction. Since precision is not ornament, ornament is really often imprecise. True ornamentation often requires imprecision. And this is the roughness property that we discussed earlier and that was observed by Alexander. And again, we have the, the linguistic branding of roughness as something negative, but this is not a celebration of sloppiness, but this is an intrinsic phenomenon. This is a positive uh, mechanism. We pay attention to the ornamentation because we want to imbue life in the building. So if we pay attention to the binding energy, it will give life to a building. If instead we pay attention to useless precision, that's, a, that's an intellectual luxury. It does not help our building. Our building remains dead.
That's why so many buildings today are dead by design. And I can conclude. Architectural life of a building depends upon the ornament. Which ornament? Well, that's for you to decide. That's for the uh, location. The architect chooses a form language. You remember the, the um, algorithmic sustainable design steps. You choose your form language or you create your form language. But today I have emphasized the smaller mm -hmm. scale. The living quality of the structure and the form come from binding energy. And the binding energy comes from the smaller scales. They depend strongly upon the lowest scale in the hierarchy, and that is the ornamental scale. Therefore, architecture is form plus ornament. And I can conclude by saying that ornament becomes substance. Can we revisit the great architects of the past? They knew all of this. I'm giving this lecture in the United States. I'm especially proud of American architects. Frank Lloyd Wright, except in his last buildings. Louis Sullivan, Thomas Jefferson. We have a great uh, rainbow of, of, uh, of American architects who created fantastic ornament. So their buildings are alive. Look at the traditional architecture of any country and look at the ornament. The ornament makes the buildings alive. The, or the ornament gives you the foundation of the form language. Today I mentioned the classical form language. And let me, let me uh, uh, repeat again what Donald Ratner says. The, the moldings, the moldings so despised by the modernist architects, the classical moldings are the small levels of ornamentation. They give life to, the, to a classical uh, building. So I hope uh, people will think about this lecture and, uh, and, and uh, try to incorporate some of these ideas to make better buildings. Thank you.